Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I, re I have to scream, yeah? I mean, this, is it good? Okay, this microphone is predominantly for the camera, so don't expect big noises from the microphone. Good morning. Um, I'm very happy to have all of you here, so thanks a lot for joining. Uh, this morning is about new experiences, at least for us, I have to say. Uh, it is A, about Magic Leap, and we have the glasses here, and apologize that, they are, that we are relatively late because we wanted to start at 8, but there was a miscommunication. The glasses are here, Luke will come in a second as well, and we can test the glasses and the storytelling via VR technology in the break. Having said that, I'm really happy to be here at the Zurich Development Center, ZTC, so to speak, and welcome Chris. So Chris, thanks a lot for coming. Hey, Monica. So Chris and I met via LinkedIn. Yes, yeah? of course. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris wrote me a message saying, oh, we have to meet and I have some good tips for you. So and I, looked at, I looked at his picture and said, hmm, I'm not sure of the insurance industry <laughs> <You're working laughs> is, on it, <laughs> is, <laughs> is ready to get to those experiences. Uh, and then we met and I was completely fascinated by your input, I have to say. And what I also like about Chris is it's pretty clear that Chris doesn't have the problem we talk about quite a lot, sea of sameness. Yeah? If you look at Chris, <laughs> his branding is very clear. Yeah? Uh, Black Marketing is a great company. Chris founded that company. Uh, and I was fascinated about his personal branding. And the objective this morning is to say, how can we use our branding, personal branding, but also the company branding, in order to jointly move forward and help the company to drive a certain image. And I was fascinated by Sylvia's comments to me yesterday as well. She said, oh, we spent the whole day again on data and process and how we best go forward. And communication was five minutes, yeah? This morning is about communications. Uh, this morning is about giving you inspiration. And Chris, thanks a lot for joining us. And we're looking forward mm. to your presentation. Thank you. And, and the reason why the books are at these tables down here is that all the people at the back, you notice the books are not there. So if you want a book, you're going to have to move a bit forwards to get the book there. Um, so this is very much about you. <clears throat> and unlike most people in most presentations, I actually encourage you to put your phones on and to take pictures and do videos and then tag me to show you actually listening to what I'm talking about here and put it into practice. But also because we're going to do a test about halfway through. So you need to have a LinkedIn app. So if you don't have the LinkedIn app, Download the LinkedIn app, register, log in. You're looking very confused, we've got the LinkedIn app. <laughs> You're going, what's an app? <laughs> but I'll show you a trick which you can use for events and conferences, <clears throat> which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, but about halfway through, so I want to make sure you're paying attention, but it's really, really good, and it'll basically get you all connected as well. So look out for that. But this is very much about you. So I want you to ask questions along the way as well. If you find out something or you don't understand something, please do just put your hand up and just ask a question. Don't leave it to the end, ask a question along the way. It's very much about, you know, Monica's brought me in here to basically enable you to basically use LinkedIn more for the benefit of yourselves and the benefit of Zurich Insurance. It has to be a win-win. So that's why we've got the two books, the personal branding one, so you can look at that one about you, but also the social selling one, which is about you and how you market Zurich through your LinkedIn profile, through your content marketing. So you don't have one book, you can exchange it for the other book and vice versa. You can always go to Amazon, Amazon of course, and download my Kindle versions of all three books, of course, you can do that as well. Very cheap on Amazon. Um, so there's very much top 10 tips about how you can use LinkedIn. But why listen to me? Because there's plenty of other people out there who pretend to be LinkedIn trainers or experts or whatever, but none of them have nearly a thousand recommendations on LinkedIn about what to do on LinkedIn about the, um, being an author and so forth. Uh, and none of them also have, for example, LinkedIn Power Profile Awards, which is actually what LinkedIn awarded me for the last seven years, being the most engaged people person in Singapore with regards to LinkedIn itself. Um, and we also won several business level uh, B2B marketing awards, um, including B2B Asia Marketing Award of the Year last year. And we have the three books. So the one you don't see at the moment is actually this one here which is called LinkedIn Mastery for Entrepreneurs, now it's second edition, which again, you can get on audiobook, you can get on Spotify, you can get on iTunes, wherever you want to do it. So if you've got Spotify, it's free, just listen to the audiobook. It's an excellent version. The personal branding book and the social selling book. Uh, but we have five different brands, or six different brands on LinkedIn, which we actually created. So I created Black Marketing six years ago because I saw a need for people who weren't using LinkedIn properly, who were running businesses. 
And then we created a Rockstar keynote speaker in December. And this is very much about women speakers, because we noticed lots of basically panels and keynote speakers, all men, particularly in Asia. And so we basically created a brand which promotes women speakers across the world. We have now over 125 women speakers from America to Sydney, Hong Kong to Zurich, who basically we now represent. And we're now pushing women speakers to basically at least get 50-50 on panels, for example, or at least get recognized as being a keynote and not just have men being recognized and men being chosen because they're a man, not because of the quality of their talk, which happens time and time again. Uh, we also have a conference brow, which is called Social Selling 2019. We had it at Microsoft last year in, um, in Asia. This year, we're going to have it at the biggest venue, the best venue, the most Instagram venue in the whole world, Marina Bay Sands in Singapore. Uh, we have a PR arm called Dark Art, and we have a TripAdvisor art, arm art, appropriately called Mohawk, where we combine TripAdvisor with LinkedIn. So all our brands, including the Masterclass brand, which is what this is about, is actually about LinkedIn. So they're all connected to LinkedIn in some way to actually look at niches and actually enable people and business owners and people like yourselves to actually use LinkedIn properly. So why? Fundamentally, if you Google someone, so if I Google, for example, Monica, the first thing that comes up is her LinkedIn. The first one is actually Crunchbase, but the second one is about LinkedIn. So without even actually putting LinkedIn into Google itself, it comes up first or second or third, unless you happen to be dead or a dead celebrity or a celebrity that's not dead. In that case, you come up first or second after Wikipedia. But nine times out of 10, if you Google yourselves, and you should Google yourselves, because people meeting you are Googling you, people about to meet you are Googling, people are just curious about you are Googling you too. So people aren't, and if you're single and you go on a date, they're also Googling you. So basically, you want to make sure your LinkedIn profile's up to scratch, and it comes to that, because your first impression, obviously very good impression of Monica, telling people what to do there. <laughs> so it's all about that first impression, um, and using the background picture, for example, same thing with Zurich Insurance. You should obviously be following the Zurich Insurance company page on LinkedIn. Uh, many of you are not, so you should be doing it now. Quickly go to the app and start following. We'll do compliance later. Uh, obviously, the Zurich Insurance page has about 339,000 followers, for example, of your 21,000 employees. Uh, but why LinkedIn? Why I came to Singapore 10 years ago, I escaped England because I hadn't seen the sun for many, many years, and I predicted Brexit. No, I didn't predict I wish I had predicted Brexit, but obviously I saw the fact that people in Singapore, people in London, where I used to work, for example, used to like dealing with people in London. I used to say to them, oh, what about Europe? Oh, that's a bit far. Don't want to cross, cross that whole channel. Whereas Singapore is a bit like Switzerland. Basically, they realize they can't just deal with themselves. They have to actually go out to the whole of Asia Pacific. So when I got my first, my second, and my third jobs, I got them through LinkedIn by networking. Those jobs were actually marketing jobs across the whole of Asia Pacific, which is two thirds of the world's population. And I didn't know anybody in China and in India and in Japan and Australia, so I started using LinkedIn. And then we started winning business, and then start, people started to say to us, well, can you do my LinkedIn? Because it takes a lot of time. And it does. And I employ 35 people in Singapore to do it for other people. But we have clients across the whole world. The reason I'm in Zurich is because Zurich is my second biggest market. Because people in Zurich get it. The fact that you basically have to look at the global world and the global economy, not just your own particular country. Uh, so that's why LinkedIn has over 620, well, 610 million users now. And you'll see it is global. It's truly, truly global. There are only two countries in the world where LinkedIn are not. Does anyone know which two countries they are? No, it's Turkey. Turkey has not. Turkey has loads. Look, Turkey has North Korea is one and Russia is the other one. Correct. So basically, the only two countries in the world, as you can see here, Russia has nobody and North Korea also has nobody. China, you'll see here, has 45 million. India, 55 million. And obviously, the States has 157 million. So it is big across the whole world. And that's why it works. Because someone like Facebook or even someone like Weibo or someone like WeChat, for example, they're regional businesses. Even someone like Zing is only basically big in Germany. And even there, LinkedIn now has as many users as Zing does in Germany. And when I did, we've got lots of clients in Germany. And the reason they use us is because basically Zing helps them deal with people in Germany. But they want to go outside of Germany. They're a bit screwed if they're just using Zing. They have to use LinkedIn, which is why we come into force. But you can see here, it is literally across the whole of the, universe, whole of the, whole of the country, whole of the world even down to Brazil and so forth as well. So that's why if you want to get to these countries, you have to be using LinkedIn. And it is truly global. But it's also a gamification platform. Does anyone know what I mean by gamification? Indeed. So what's the benefit of making, what's the benefit of making a game out of it? Oh, it's much more engaging. It's a natural human instinct is to play games. 
Yeah. Yeah. Totally, totally. And it rewards you as well. So you get rewarded on LinkedIn, for example. The more you do on LinkedIn, and one of the reasons why you should be doing things on LinkedIn is because you will be rewarded. So the more activity you do on LinkedIn, the more you get boost up the rankings, the more your status increases on LinkedIn, the more your search results go up, for example, just by doing things on LinkedIn. Because LinkedIn reward you for doing things. They also punish you for not doing things. So it becomes very addictive, which is what they want. So you find yourself in a date or Christmas day still doing things on LinkedIn because basically it becomes very addictive. And you shouldn't really be doing that. But I like this quote from James Blunt because it sums up LinkedIn. I'm self-deprecating because I'm English. If I was American, I would tell you how great I was. And with any apologies for any Americans in the room, Americans are born with a DNA which says promote, promote, promote. They get taught at you know, junior school about how to, how to pitch and how to promote. Isn't that true? <laughs> Whereas English people like myself go, no, 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 it's a team effort. No, no, I couldn't possibly promote myself. No, no, I don't want to do any of that. The problem with doing that is there will be some American who comes along and steals that job or that investment or gets that opportunity. So you have to be more American on LinkedIn than not because lots of Americans on LinkedIn basically say they created water or they created this or they created this table or that book or whatever. And you can see that by who's in the president of the United States. It obviously works in America, but the rest of the world needs to cotton on the fact you need to promote yourselves. Because otherwise you end up being like, and I live in Asia, and believe me, Asians are even worse than English people when it comes to promoting themselves. They do not want to do it. So you have to bring them out of their shell. And remember, it's professional. It's not personal. It's professional. It's your professional brand in a professional context. That's why, for example, I'm not on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Focus completely on LinkedIn because it's about your professional brand. And the same thing with you regards to Zurich Insurance. So we believe there's four different ways of doing that. One is about you your personal branding, which we're going to talk about today. One's about content marketing, which we're going to go into a lot today, because lots of you are in marketing and don't do any content marketing, which we'll come on to later on when we look at your profiles. Uh, one is about company branding, about how you market Zurich, for example, on LinkedIn. And then we talk about a bit about social selling. And that's what the book very much covers. And we'll talk about that right at the end, because you can't do social selling unless you have a good personal brand, unless you have a good content marketing strategy, unless you're actually marketing the company the right way. So the visual impression is the most one. So one of the reasons I have a mohawk, for example, is to emphasize the fact that every single person, whether you like it or not, has a mohawk of some kind. It doesn't have to be an actual mohawk, it can be a metaphorical mohawk. And the visual impression, particularly on LinkedIn, is like any visual impression, like a networking, it's how you create that positive first impression. So if I show you this, you get a positive impression or a negative impression of the joker. He has a personal brand, whether you like it or not. He has certain values of disruption or chaos and technology, and he does whatever he wants, but he dresses in a certain way, has hair in a certain way, has a certain uniform. You know when he's about to walk into a room, he has that kind of charisma. And I'll show you someone like uh, our GPS girl here, for example, Karen Jacobson. Her mohawk is effectively the GPS. She is the voice of the GPS. So she's on two billion devices going recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. And she's on Siri as well. So she, but she's created an entire personal brand being the GPS girl, but she's also a keynote speaker, concert performer, but she's built the whole thing on the fact that she's the GPS girl. In the same way that, for example, Steve has bought the whole thing about being a coach. So he's gone big on the fact he's a coach, even though he's on Fox Sports, that's not the reason why he wants to be famous. He's famous because he's a very good coach. That's his business. Someone like Andrew, for example, is about self-leadership. So he's motivating, he's focusing on leadership. Whereas someone like Jacinta is focusing on the fact she's a tech leader. He used to work for Dow and Microsoft. That's differentiating her personal brand on LinkedIn. It's something like Avi here, for example, is delivering delight. He's the chief delight officer. So he's going on the fact that no one else has figured out how to create delight within multinationals. So he does that. And even Sophia the robot, for example, has a USP. Her robot, her basically, she's on LinkedIn as well. And she accepted my invitation. She's posting left, right, and center at the moment because they've actually created a little robot, a little Sophia. Uh, and she goes around doing things. But basically, her, obviously, mohawk the fact she's a robot, and she's on LinkedIn. So don't do things like this. Because as much as I might aspire one day to be George Clooney, I'm not. So I can't use his photograph on my LinkedIn. And headless people don't seem to get very far in life. So a headless person walked in here, wouldn't do very well. And this is what I call your classic Facebook photograph. You're having a few drinks. Someone says, dress as a panda. You're saying, oh, why not? I've had a few drinks. Somebody else says, let's do a photograph, put it on your LinkedIn. You probably had a few drinks by now. So you think, yeah, why not? 
In the morning, you totally regret it. Don't do Facebook photographs on LinkedIn. And which one's Melita? <laughs> Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. It's like, how do you create a relationship with someone when you can't even tell who that person is? And why do you use things like animals on your LinkedIn profile, particularly like Guinness symbols? Unless you happen to be the brand director of Guinness, don't use that symbol either. And I didn't know what was going through his mind when he thought it'd be a good idea to be like, a, like on the side rather than being straight. He just thought, no, let's be different. Let's have my, let's like on a cliff or something. It's a very strange photograph. And this guy couldn't decide which photograph to use. <laughs> so he used them all in one photograph, which looks terrible on the mobile. It's this big, it's very, very small. And Elizabeth here went for the full Tinder look. She used her Tinder photograph on her LinkedIn. But the problem with that is that she works in the Hyatt Hotel Group as the human resources manager. <laughs> Hashtag me too. <laughs> Not a great idea, Elizabeth. Definitely, definitely don't do this. I mean, I live in Singapore. So doing something like this is really like a cardinal sin, especially if you're in China. <laughs> Jason hasn't been seen for many, many weeks now as a result of this. So your personal brand positioning statement is also very important. So you have to think about how you describe yourself. It's that kind of like 10 second positioning statement, for example. Is that how do you describe yourself in a lift or at a networking event? What is your personal branding? Because it also gets picked up on LinkedIn. It's your keywords on LinkedIn. So you've got Nike, you know, just do it. Or Apple is think different. Yeah, mine is the only CEO with a mohawk, for example, so it just creates that kind of point of difference. You have to think about what makes you stand out, because your headline follows you every single place on LinkedIn. Everywhere you go on LinkedIn, your headline follows you. So you have an opportunity to market yourself and your company through your headline on LinkedIn. So you look at when you share something, for example, it comes up at the top. When you basically like something, it comes up. When you comment on something, it comes up. <clears throat> when you're tagged by somebody else, it also comes up. When you appear in search, for example, it comes up. And it comes up in terms of keywords, comparative to other people, for example. So it gives you an opportunity to market yourself against other people. So it's all organic as well. And even on other people's profiles, you see, for example, mine there, and some bloke called Bill Gates is down there. But it comes up because that's an opportunity too to market yourself when you appear on other people's profiles. You can challenge people as well. I like the way Mike Mackey did this. The coolest guy in Nashville. Google it to see for yourself, because he's in SEO. So we went, okay, let's do that. And he is. We Googled him, and he's the coolest guy in Nashville. <laughs> but imagine he came second. He won't be the second coolest guy in Nashville. Doesn't have the same ring about it. And even if you're, for example, you're hiring, say you're hiring. So people know to apply to you. People know to contact you. Simplest thing sometimes on LinkedIn. If you're looking for a job, tell people. How are people supposed to know? If you don't say you're looking for opportunities, how are they supposed to know you're looking for a job? So we actually approached, for example, Crystal, she became an employee because she actually said, I'm looking for a job. Because otherwise, we wouldn't have known that just by her profile. Now, your background pitch is also phenomenally important. It's the way of marketing yourself, or marketing Zurich, for example. So don't miss the opportunity. It's prime real estate on LinkedIn. And many of you do not have a background picture, for example. You see, Andrew's used this at the Ritz-Carlton. You know, the bar at the Ritz-Carlton and the Shanghai, you want to go to that bar. You know, it has a massive impact in terms of branding, in terms of first impressions. Look at Dahlia here, who's an SME in Singapore, euphoric coaching. So she's marketing her brand immediately so you know what she's about. You know, Ryan here is on the BBC and Amazon Prime, Discovery. He goes to the top of mountains and talks about leadership. So there he is on the top of a mountain saying, here I am. So very, very succinct. You know what his brand's all about. And visually, it gives a massive impact on his personal brand. You can do the same thing. This is all free functions on LinkedIn. And Jane went for the whole branding up there. Humility is the new power. She's on stage. She's got a book. There are her three core brand values there. You can do the same thing. Uh, you look at Pippa here. Pippa uh, has actually got Pippa Nuts, which I really love as a brand. She's got a product up there. Simple stuff. She's marketing her products. So you go there going, wow, that's fantastic. I love the fact she's combined her name with the branding. She created this wonderful, smooth peanut butter around almonds. Brilliant. Simple stuff. And even Mark here, for example, who works for Oracle, has gone for slightly esoteric kind of when it rains, get an umbrella kind of way. But at least he makes you think. And you go, wow, OK, what's he on about then? What's that got to do with Oracle? And you might want to contact him as a result of it. So it's simple stuff. But LinkedIn is not dynamic. So for example, the reason why there's a big, great big gap here is because this is what it looks like on the laptop. But this is what it looks like on the mobile. The photograph changes from there to there. So you do have to design it in such a way it's at the top and on the right-hand side. Otherwise, you are kind of missing opportunity, or you can go bang in the middle of your message. 
So don't do things like this. Lonely and young girl. Again, LinkedIn's not, <laughs> LinkedIn is not Tinder. So she's on a swing all by herself and she's on LinkedIn. Or this, human being. Elbert felt the need to put human being down in case someone did a search on LinkedIn to find someone who was a human being musician. And Dave Kay here went for the exact demigod, demigod at Miracle Health. I'm sorry, Dave, that's not a photograph to sell Miracle Health. <laughs> really, the thing is brand strategy there. Shelly Shara, wife of Stephen Shara. Why would you do that? Especially as Stephen did not reciprocate. He has not got husband of Shelly Shara there. <laughs> and surely he should. Because Dale has, Dale's got spouse of owner of Picosa Mexican restaurant. So he has no brand status by himself. He's just going out with someone who owns a dodgy restaurant in Hong Kong. Lecturer at retired and enjoying time with the family. Does he look like he's enjoying time with the family? <laughs> I think he'd rather be back at work. And Sean here, CEO, Accelerating Digital for Global Corporates. You think, wow, he's the CEO of a small company called HSBC. That's a multi-billion dollar organization. But then you look at his experience, and actually Sean is in charge of the website. That's not a CEO of a multi-dollar, billion dollar organization. You can't claim something you're not on LinkedIn. Karen here went for the managing director. Uh, no, personal assistant to the managing director. These are different roles or different kinds of responsibilities. You can't do that on LinkedIn. And don't do something like this. Don't do people or person of the year 2010. Because it does kind of make you wonder what happened for the last nine years then. You didn't win any awards at all? Well, this one here, which I found this morning, which I thought was amusing. Miss Switzerland 2013. Great. But what have you done since 2013? There's been six years there. Are you still leveraging the fact you won an award in 2013? No, you have to basically keep it up to date. Well, that's a bit like a TripAdvisor award for a restaurant. It wins it in 2011, and you think, why hasn't it won anything since then? And why would you do this? It's like, unless you have big muscles and you want to show that bit off, why would you miss off your head? You basically, you've uploaded something and you basically haven't checked, or your friends haven't told you it looks ridiculous, because it does look ridiculous. <laughs> and he's got a football coming out of his head as well to make it even worse. It doesn't make any sense. And if you're going to basically pitch yourself as being a keynote speaker, it's best to have people in the room at the time. Because <laughs> having an empty room basically says you're a terrible keynote speaker and should not be hired. And the one person in the room is basically his back turn and is leaving. <laughs> not a great picture. And if you're marketing, you guys are in marketing, you really should use some of your very expensive collateral as your background picture. So if you're the, for example, CMO of Visa, you really shouldn't have that as a background picture because Visa has quite a lot of collateral which you could use as a background. You really have no excuse. And don't do it again. <laughs> yes, he is, precisely. And when he was at Coke, he also didn't use it. And like, it's like you're in Coke <laughs> and Visa. You have no excuse. <laughs> But many, many people also do this. Why would you do this? So Belle here basically says she used to work at a good company. She used to work at Uber. She used to work at Netflix. She used to work at Spotify. You notice she doesn't put her latest company there. So she's embarrassed about where she currently works. I want to leave with the fact she used to work at lots of different companies. But the worst people to do this are people who used to work at Google. So I did a search, ex-Google. 46,000 people have ex-Google on their LinkedIn profile. I, they used to work at a really cool company, but they don't anymore. But they still want to leverage the fact they used to work there. Even to the extent where this guy actually does work at Google, but still wants you to know he used to work at McKinsey and Goldman Sachs. It's like, you work at Google, you do what all these other people basically want to achieve. Don't do that, it looks terrible. But you do need to complete your profile, and many, many people here do not have a complete profile because it affects your search on LinkedIn, your organic search. You need to fill in your summary section, experience section, simple stuff. Tell your story on your summary section. It's about you. It's your opportunity to have 2,000 characters talk about you. And you have three lines to basically bring people in. Otherwise, they don't say, show more. So don't open it up by going, I work in insurance, because that's a really good way of getting people not to go, show more. <laughs> So think about something interesting and then basically talk about your career at Zurich and what you've done, for example, and make it really compelling. And then you tell your story. And it needs to be in the first person, not the third person. Because if you go to a networking event and started talking in the third person, it would look really odd. Chris did this and Chris did that. People would start moving away. Don't do that. Don't do it on LinkedIn. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's personal. 
and add things like videos. You can watch videos on your LinkedIn, and a video is the key to LinkedIn. There's a big report this morning published by LinkedIn that said LinkedIn is outperforming all other content on LinkedIn tenfold. So if you're not doing video, you're missing out on a content marketing strategy, which we're going to talk about a bit later on. <clears throat> then you need to add in what your company does. The key to this is to copy your company page. Symbol. Copy and paste your company page and put on what you do. And then you have brand consistency. Then you have a link to your YouTube channel, for example, and you have a link to your website. So for you, it'll be this, because this is how you describe yourself on the Zurich company page. And only about th two of you, I think, are actually doing this. But so you need to be actually putting this down in terms of how you're describing Zurich and then having a link to your website and having a link to your YouTube channel. Because you actually have a lot of video content, but you're not actually using it. There's hardly any of you have actually got videos from your YouTube channel, which has got basically hundreds of hundreds of videos which you can use on your LinkedIn profile to actually make your LinkedIn profile look very cool. So what else do you do? Fill in the gaps. Because your personal brand isn't just about your experience now, it's about your experience in general. So for example, I lecture at New National University in Singapore. So I put that down. I also contribute to the Business Times, which is a publication like the FT in Singapore, for example. So I put that down. And then I also mentor people at SMU, Singapore Management University. So I put that down. Because it fills in my personal brand, lets people know what else I do. But it also means people can reach out to me, for example, for those particular areas. So it works. And what else do you do in terms of your profile? You know, that non-profit stuff. Add those bits in too. Get your recommendations and your skills and awards. Put those down there. And make sure your skills, for example, are representative of your personal brand, about what you actually do do now. And try and get them endorsed. So for example, I get endorsed by social selling by people who work at LinkedIn and Microsoft. Because that has more power if you get endorsed by people who actually know what they're doing in those particular areas. And then put your owners, put your organizations, put your publications down. And tell people where you are. So I travel quite a bit, I'm sure you do too. So tell people where you are on LinkedIn. So for example, last time I was here in December, I changed my profile to say I was live in Zurich and Cologne with a nice picture and the tagline there with a the plane, for example. In Tokyo the week before, so again, you put that there. So you let people know you're going to be there. Because don't forget your headline follows you around. So you let people know in those particular countries you will be there. So they might reach out and say, let's meet up, let's have a coffee, let's have a drink and do some business. You'll see Landy does here, for example, you know, using the plane and saying, next stop Greece or next stop New Zealand. Simple things. Change your profile. Change your picture. It's up to you to basically make it work for you. You can change this on a regular basis. You know, Ron Kaufman here, for example, does 200 days a year outside of Singapore. So he travels all over the place. So he's actually putting in a plane here. Next stop, Sacramento. Next stop, San Diego. Even when he's in Singapore, for example, he puts the fact he's in Singapore because he's very rarely there. So people want to see him, they'll actually put that back. So think about how you're using this as a live, meet, as a live marketing function, using the banner and the headline to market yourself on a consistent basis. Even when you follow your passions, for example, so I went to Hong Kong to see Guns N' Roses because they weren't playing in Singapore. So I put that there and I got so many people going, oh, I'll meet you at the concert, I'll meet you after the concert. And then you basically form relationships there in a business context. But you're using the power of your passions to actually do so. Don't do things like this. A lifelong passion for problem solving describes nothing. It's not personal. It could be anybody in this room. Or this, business leader. It's terrible. Describes nothing at all about that particular person's brand has to be more descriptive, has to be more personal. And don't do this. This is the love doctor. And the love doctor basically is very focused on what the love doctor does, because obviously the love doctor is still a business. So on LinkedIn, he basically says he sorts out affair, other person. It's like, how do you have an affair by yourself? I'm not really sure about that one. And he sorts out, like, get your lover back. And then he sorts out all your problems. So he sorts out your divorce. But then he basically, he went out on a different branch. He basically got sick of just doing love, decided to sort out your business problem, and your study problem. And then he basically a desire love problem. So he came back to the love business. But my favorite service that this guy does, the love doctor does, very, very niche service. Be free from enemy, forward slash second wife. <laughs> so it's a very niche service that obviously the first wife business had gone already. And the third wife business, has come to, I just love the way he uses the term enemy and first second wife at the same time. And if you're going to recommend somebody, actually recommend somebody. So don't just put some inverted commas and then just leave that. Actually check you have recommended somebody. It doesn't look very good. And Peter here is out of work. So LinkedIn tell me that Peter is celebrating a work anniversary at four years at out of work. 
How many people would then say, congratulations, Peter, for being out of work for four years? That's why he looks so miserable there. And don't be endorsed for PowerPoint, Excel, and telling the time. You want to actually have some real skills in those particular areas. But if you're English like me, you do not want to be endorsed for awesomeness and general awesomeness. <laughs> Only Americans are allowed to be endorsed for those kind of things. That's true. But you want to SEO, you want to search engine optimize your profile. It's all organic on LinkedIn. Use keywords. So it won't surprise you to know that I have the most search profile in the whole of the world because this is what we do. We optimize and we make sure that our profiles of our clients and myself are actually optimized so they're actually getting a lot of searches. And often we do that by adding in positions. So I have hundreds and hundreds of positions on my profile, not because I have hundreds of jobs, but because I'm actually using LinkedIn's algorithm against itself. So for example, I put in the fact that I do masterclasses in places like Melbourne and Sydney and London, because if you look in those particular cities, you will find me. If I don't put it there, you won't find me. So if you do business in other countries, in other cities, make sure you're listed on LinkedIn as doing business there. Then when people search for that business, you will be found. So think about how you're using LinkedIn's algorithm and the search profile um, for the benefit of your business. And when you use things like keywords, for example, like personal branding, see 65,000 results come up because I've got it there and there and there, I come number one. So use the search, which is organic on LinkedIn to benefit yourselves. And then you want to create a content marketing plan. So we believe in the 411 strategy, which goes across all social media. LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Weibo, Twitter, uh, WeChat, whatever you want to do. 411 is one hard sell post. So that's one hard sell post about Zurich, about Zurich insurance. But don't just do all hard sell posts about Zurich insurance because you'll guarantee people will start following you and hide your feed and basically maybe even disconnect from you. So make sure you have a soft sell post which can be about financial services or fintech or something about the industry. And then four unrelated posts. So the four unrelated posts about your personal passions in a professional context, in a business context. But they give you permission to do the hard sell post because you're giving back to somebody. You're generally sharing information they can actually think about and they can actually benefit from. If you don't do the four unrelated posts, you haven't earned the right to do the hard sell post. So don't fall into a trap of just doing Zurich, Zurich, Zurich the whole time because you'll get no engagement as a result of it. You'll see it on the stats. But if you genuinely give value back, you will actually get people reading your hard sell and soft sell posts as well. You want to blog and share. So you look at someone like Christy Lestat, for example. She shares things about the things that are happening in the world, but she gets good traction. But it's when she makes it personal that she gets the real traction. So when Anthony Bourdain died, for example, she wrote a post about that. She got more traction. When Kate Spade died, for example, she wrote a post about her first Kate Spade bag. And she got more traction because she made it personal. So it's business and personal at the same time. And she got more traction. You had customer experience. We have a brand in Singapore called Grab, which is a terrible taxi brand. But it took over Uber, for example. A lot of people complain about it. And this post here was showing how Grab were using their monopoly situation to actually exploit customers. And because lots of other people felt the same way, she's got over 300,000 views on one small post. And more to the point, she got hundreds and hundreds of other people actually saying, yes, this is my experience as well. So she's using it for customer experience because the who she was, who she is in the industry. And obviously it's authentic and other people are empathized with it as well. I went to a Japanese restaurant in Singapore, for example, and they did this. They served Perrier Jouet in a Moe and Chandon glass. And when I asked, why are you serving Perrier Jouet in a Moe and Chandon glass? They genuinely replied they hadn't smashed all the, Perrier, the Moe and Chandon glasses yet. So they hadn't got rid of all these glasses and so they're going to use it up and actually make sure they smash those first before they started using the Perrier Jouet glasses. They actually had Perrier Jouet glasses. They didn't want to use them. So basically when I did this post, it got like 50,000 views. More importantly, the brand director, Perrier Jouet, rang me up and said, name the restaurant and I'll send you a crate of champagne. That's an easy decision to make. So a crate of champagne arrived and she had to go to the restaurant and they literally got rid of all the Moe and Chandon glasses. Because you can imagine how many people on Instagram were basically congratulating each other with Perrier Jouet champagne and the Moe and Chandon glass. And are laughing their heads off because they get the brand benefit. You also have to be yourself on LinkedIn. It is an authentic platform. It's about you. People are buying into you. People are following you. So be yourself. So for example, this is a, uh, like my most successful photograph because it got me five clients. But it does not mention my company once or in fact my service. It talks about the Ritz-Carlton in Hong Kong, which is one of the best and greatest hotels in the world. It's also the highest hotel in the world. 
as you can see by the clouds outside, for example. But I arrived, and my room wasn't ready. They apologized most profusely. And they said, Mr. Reed, we can give you the boardroom for free. We normally charge for that. I go, wow, that's amazing. So I took all my clients there, and they thought, wow, Chris has got the boardroom at the Ritz-Carlton for free. This is amazing. But I took a picture, and I did a little post saying how amazing it was. Customer service was so fantastic. And it got 55,000 views, and other, lots of other people actually saying the same thing. Yeah, Ritz-Carlton is really about customer service. It's amazing. More importantly, this guy here, a guy in white, is the CEO of the company that owns the Ritz-Carlton in Hong Kong. And he saw it, and he saw the traction it got, and went, oh, we should be doing this. So he demanded a meeting with me, and he became a client. And then the Ritz-Carlton became a client. Ritz-Carlton in Shanghai became a client. The W Hotel became a client. All through one photograph, not about my business. So it's actually about sharing authentic experiences and actually getting resonance that way. And you can be spontaneous as well, and authentic and even on a Sunday. And I actually find that posting on days when multinationals don't post are the best way to get traction. Because LinkedIn's still professional, it's still social. People are still looking for content on a Sunday or Chinese New Year or Christmas Day, would you believe? But multinationals are not posting because they tend to work Monday to Friday. Whereas us entrepreneurs have to work seven days a week. So I went to Japan, for example, and this happened to me. Literally opened my bag, because I obviously looked very suspicious, and started going through, I kid you not, doing this with every single book, looking for something. Watch, obviously watching too many spy movies where they'd hollowed out the book part and got the key inside or the cocaine or the guns. Literally, you can see their amusement there about doing it. And I cheekily took a picture and put it on LinkedIn before they could stop me. And, and, and just amazing in terms of the traction. They also went through my business cards here because I was obviously going to hide something in my business cards. Um, and they even asked me the question. The best thing, they asked me the question. They said, are these your books? <laughs> and I really shouldn't have said so, but I basically said, how many other people with a mohawk are coming through in Tokyo on a Sunday night with a look like me? They weren't very amused. Um, but more importantly, on a Sunday night, it got 40,000 views and 89 comments of other people also saying they'd had terrible times at airports across the world. So there was one guy, for example, who said he got stopped 50 times in Singapore. So he's relating that story. People in America, people in Shanghai. And because it's a business phenomenon of being stopped, for example, people are able to relate to the story and then empathize and then share it. And because it was on a Sunday and nobody else was sharing, it got higher traction as a result of it. So do look out for opportunities when basically it's authentic experiences, people will empathize with you. And you have to be observational too. So I mentioned the fact that we have Grab in Singapore because it eaten up Uber. Well, we have now have a rival to Grab, which is called Gojek. So Gojek are basically now commandeering all the taxi stands in Singapore to try and fight back about against Grab. And for people who hate Grab, now want to go see Gojek actually succeed. I shared this photograph. And again, on a Sunday, got 10,000 views because you're sharing something which is basically interesting in a marketing context. Let people know what people are doing. And you can basically relate a story that people can empathize with. So last week, for example, Chinese New Year in Singapore, although I was working because we had lots of clients in a place like Zurich, I ended up in hospital with food poisoning. And even though I was in hospital on Chinese New Year, I obviously saw an opportunity to actually post it on LinkedIn. So I did this uh, picture about how amazing the service was, but also a perspective of the guy next to me was having a heart attack. So I was in with food poisoning, thinking I was having a bad day. But the guy next to me was having a severe heart attack. So I go, okay, maybe the, my day's actually just improved. I'm not having a heart attack. So they did a post about it, and literally on Chinese New Year, when the whole of Asia is basically not there, it's still got 31,000 views and 149 comments and likes. People were still engaging. People were still looking for content. They're probably bored of having Chinese New Year celebrations with their family and looking out there in you know, different platforms. So do look about how you do that, and even meeting interesting people. So for example, you know, every time I meet interesting people like yourselves, and we had a few photographs beforehand, share it because people like that on LinkedIn. It is authentic, it's still social. LinkedIn is still a social platform. It doesn't have to be business, business, business. Just post things in a business context. That's all it's about. And you can crowdsource. So when we launched Rockstar, for example, I mistakenly, and it was a big mistake, and I nearly made a fundamental error, put all my logos in pink, because I thought, it's a women Rockstar, it's a women keynote speaking service. Surely it has to be pink. And literally, I had, I had 42,000 comments, 190 comments, 189 says, don't use pink, Chris. One person said, use pink. And I go, oh, okay, then I've made a complete uh, boo-boo here. And so I actually changed the branding to be purple and red and black and white as a result of it. But by crowdsourcing on LinkedIn, I got a professional opinion. I got professional opinions of other people. And it cost me nothing. So I could have made a fundamental error because I could have picked, for example, that one there, which I liked. 
and all the white women liked, but all the Asians pointed out that it was a white woman. So that wasn't very good when you're promoting women across the whole universe to only have one section of society. Well, that's a pretty good thing to say. So we actually ended up with a combination of that one and that one, for example, as a result of that. But it cost me nothing to do this research. And I was going to professionals who cared about you know, helping somebody else. And that's what LinkedIn's all about. So you want to share your passions as well. So as I mentioned, I went to Guns N' Roses, and I compared the fact that they have a fantastic brand that lasted for 30 years. And I compared it to being a normal brand. Um, and it was great to actually share that and say, the contrast now between when I saw them in Hong Kong this year and in, you know, when I was 18 years old, when they basically came on five hours late, played for 10 minutes, smashed their guitars up, all high on coke. Basically, it was like, but now they're basically a professional band doing a half a billion dollar tour. They realize they come on at eight, they leave at 11, they do a professional set, they do all the hits, they go off, they go to the next one. They become very professional. And it's all about how that brand actually grew up along the way. And you do want to amplify your thoughts outside of LinkedIn on LinkedIn. So if you do interviews or get coverage elsewhere, that's great, but you get no viewers comparative to how if you share it on LinkedIn, where you've got potentially 600 million people at your audience. So for example, there's a, another stat you want to take care of, which is 1990. 1% 1 on people on social media, all social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, Instagram, everything, share. 1%. So if you look at this room now, that means two of you sharing. 9% like, share, and comment. Only 9%. 90% do nothing. Nothing at all. They just view the content. So you want to be a leader, you want to be a 1%. You don't want to be the nine or the 90. 9% is very, very important because that's how you think get things to go viral. But the 90% do nothing for you whatsoever. So you want to be in the 1%. Good example of that is an entrepreneur in Singapore called Stephanie Yun. Now, she's in the legal world, which you can imagine in Singapore, it's quite tough for a woman at all. But also, she's quite an extroverted, extravagant woman. And she deals with a lot of government contracts. So she has to be quite careful what she does. But she does it amazingly well to actually promote the fact that you know, they won several awards, for example, and every time she's quoted in like the FT or the BT or different publications, she puts it on LinkedIn. She lets you know she's a leader. She lets you know that she's not to be reckoned with, basically, and you basically want to take her seriously. So she puts all her interviews there, or she puts on when she's in the American lawyer, for example, or her colleagues are there, for example. Or even when she's quoted, she puts it on there to make sure that you know. Because by doing this, she doesn't just get the fact that she's got it in the publication, she gets the kudos of being in the publication, and she gets it read by more people, because LinkedIn is global. Whereas the publication just been very, very niche with a couple of hundred thousand people, for example. So think about how you amplify content. And then you want to curate content and share that, but try and put a quote on it, try and make it personal. So I like Mark Ritson. Mark Ritson's very, very good uh, in terms of putting out controversial comment in a marketing context. So you put this uh, interview here about how he shared content, what was the really cool way of sharing content, to make sure it got traction. And it's something I do as well. He basically said that if you go through his comments, 30 people support him, 38 people don't really care, and 32 people think he's a tosser. And I think that's the best way of doing it because you need the antis as well as the pros to make something go viral. So you need to be putting out content there which makes people think. You want to amplify your media appearances. So for example, I was on Money FM, which is the radio station in Singapore a couple weeks ago. That wasn't the fact I was on Money FM, which was important. It was the fact I used that on LinkedIn to amplify it so other people then knew I was on Money FM. So beforehand, it was like this. During it, it was like this. So you make sure people see it. And then afterwards, you're sharing the interview. So I know more people listened to my interview on LinkedIn than did Money FM on like when it was live. But it's amplifying the fact that you were doing that, so then you get more people coming to you going, oh, wow, you sound great on radio. Will you do my radio talk? Will you do my TV presenter? So you're using LinkedIn's amplification platform of your marketing. So you're gonna amplify event appearance as well. So before, you wanna say you're coming to an event, for example. You wanna do it during, with pictures. You wanna do it afterwards, with the people, for example. So again, you're amplifying, 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 but you're also making sure that people know you're a keynote speaker or whatever happens, whatever your USP happens to be, for example. And things like employer branding, you know, share about the fact that you have team events, share about this. You know, talk about what you can do about this event here, about your workshops this week, for example, and share pictures about it and tag other people. Let people know that this is what Zurich are actually doing. So this is one of our interns, for example, which I shared, thanking her for her service. So let people know we hire interns, 
as we all know, she gets a good um, experience being an intern at Black Marketing. Even other people's passions went to the Affordable Art Fair in Singapore and shared about great, author, great artists. But their passions, most of that on LinkedIn, about sharing other people's passions too. Then you want to tag influencers. So the way you tag is to do this, you do a little at, and then basically the name comes up, and then they get notification saying you have actually mentioned them in a post, or you have actually, actually um, highlighted them. And if you tag people like this, for example, you can basically get a lot of traction because suddenly 20, 000, 20 people, 30 people actually get a tag saying you've actually notified them. And I asked to hijack it, for example. This is Andrew Pickham at Microsoft. So I actually put my picture in there and tag him back, which means I get the benefit of him actually sharing that piece of content. Or I did a big event called the Primetime Professional Women's Association that tagged all the attendees and got more traction as a result of it. Because the notifications work in terms of socially selling yourself and socially selling Zurich. Because you get basically a tag every single time someone does this. You get emails basically saying this person's mentioned you. And then you get notifications saying someone's mentioned you in a post or mentioned you in a comment or liked a post that mentions you. So it works in terms of social selling. You're socially selling yourself and socially selling your company at the same time. And then LinkedIn now does hashtags. So you want to use hashtags on LinkedIn. We're doing this for about 10 months now. And you want to own hashtags which resonate with Zurich. So the obvious ones about insurance, about fintech, about certain things. But think about what keywords you want Zurich to be known for and then own those hashtags when you post about Zurich. And then own the hashtags about yourself when you post about yourself. And you know what these are if you put in, for example, hashtag social. You'll see things like social media, social media marketing, social selling, and so forth. Try and use those then. People who are actually following those hashtags, so you can follow hashtags now on LinkedIn, will actually see that. It comes up here. Hashtag personal branding, hashtag social media. So if you, if you basically share that, it works in terms of making sure your content goes further as a result of it. Now, video is key on LinkedIn. Video, 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 video. I can't emphasize that enough. Literally, LinkedIn are putting all their resources into video. They even announced this morning they're going to do live video soon. So you'll actually be able to stream this live in basically six months' time. In America, you can actually do it in a month's time. So they're testing in America first, and then it'll move over to Europe, and then about 10 years' time, it'll go to Asia. So basically, video is key, both native and YouTube. So the difference is this. This is native. So if I was to record a video now and basically upload it directly to LinkedIn, that's native video. That's using this little button here. The limit is 10 minutes. So think about two minute, three minute, four minute interviews with yourselves, with your CEO, with your chair people, with your clients. Upload it on LinkedIn, and then you get enormous traction as a result of it. So I did a test. I did a video about a new office, for example, put it on YouTube. I got a massive 35 views, and I have no idea who those people are, because you don't have to register on LinkedIn, on YouTube to actually watch a video. You got no data. Whereas on LinkedIn, you have to register. So the same video on LinkedIn, 20,000 views, and I know every single person who liked, commented, and came to my profile as a result of the video. So the T is the data on LinkedIn. You can tell who actually comes to people on your content on LinkedIn because the data, because you register on LinkedIn. You don't register on other platforms. So you want to tell stories. You know, this video here, 300,000 views. You share good news. James talking about the good week you just had, for example. Demonstrations, doing content, doing product. Share adverts and make a point. Again, Mark Ritten, 220,000 views, with his view on a particular advert in the UK, for example. Post questions to people. What do you think about this innovation? 30,000 views. Share some achievements, 82,000 views. Share bad news, doesn't have to be good news all the time. As long as it's in a business context, share this, you know, 24,000 views. Share consumer videos, put a B2B twist on it, because obviously LinkedIn's a B2B platform. Steve Blakeman did this, you know, 11,000 views. Share news first. Anthony shared this about the world's first AI, 127,000 views. Thought leaders, Bill Gates, nearly a million views. And you know who those people are, and that's the key. Reports. So this is for your marketing platforms. Apparently Pornhub is the best platform to use when it comes to marketing. I can see Zurich Insurance in the advertising on Pornhub now. Um, not Facebook, but he shared this. Got 5,000 views. Employee benefits, yeah. 373,000 views. Talking about Adobe's new office because it has a running track around the outside of it. Simple things, 373,000 views. Pretty phenomenal. Even things like education, for example. And interviews, workshops, 
but the company page on LinkedIn is not a place to share a video, as you can see here. No likes, no comments, no shares. Don't be fooled by LinkedIn basically selling you a company's page could cost you about 30,000 US and doesn't work. Do it organically. So this one here, for example, the Emirates page got tens of thousands of views because it's basically how you build a plane. Simple stuff. This one here for Qatar Airways, you're talking about basically Ramadan and the cultural effect of it. Again, authentic. It's not selling you planes. It's not selling you flights. <clears throat> it's talking about culture. Organic always beats paid for. In HSBC, you know, this has got no views, no comments, no likes. Product features as well. So this is the time we're basically going to get out your app. So get your LinkedIn app out, and we're going to do this. So this is great for an event. So you go to your app. You go to the two little people down the bottom. Okay? You press that, and it says find nearby at the top. Okay, so if you say find nearby, and you all do this, you'll all connect. So basically, these two little people here, and then find nearby. Okay, now if you all do this, you all start popping up. There you go, start popping up, start popping up. So find nearby, two little people, and find nearby. You see, everyone's now popping up on my feed. This is brilliant for an event. So there's two little people, and then find nearby. So all the people now popping up in my feed. But it only works in a room about this size, and it only works if you all do it at the same time. So it's not like WeChat or Tinder, where basically you can just reach out. It doesn't work that way. So it's amazing. Look at that. So then you can connect at least with everybody else in this room. But if we do a conference, and the biggest one I did was a thousand people in Germany in December, literally people were connecting with people all over the world because they hadn't met them, but in that room they were connecting with people they could through LinkedIn. It's just an amazing way of actually doing it. So think about how to do that. It's just really, really good for events, for conferences, for kickoffs, whatever you want to do. Does everyone manage to do that? And then you can either connect straight away, or you can basically do screen grabs and connect later with a nice personalized message. So ultimately on LinkedIn, you have to be authentic. It is very much about you. So Simone Heng's a good example of this. She's a radio DJ in Singapore. Now she's on radio, so she has no content, although she does. Because she makes sure that when she actually plays music, she tells a story and then videos herself enjoying herself playing the content. Because she's thought, well, how do I present my personal brand and show the passion for work I do and tell a story at the same time? And she gets phenomenal amounts of likes and comments, tens of thousands of views, by just doing a two-minute video for enjoying playing music at work. But when she doesn't do videos, her likes and comments plummet tenfold. So it's all about video, video, video. And when I tagged her, for example, when she came to the office, I got like, you know, like all access to her followers because she liked it, she commented back. So think about how you use influencers to basically promote yourself and your insurance, for example. And you want to mix it up. You know, Sally does this in America, in Australia, just videos, gets hundreds of thousands of views. But then she also does these kind of comments. I'm not a big fan of these, but they do get traction on LinkedIn. Do pictures, do infographics, but video is a key. Video, video, video is where she gets the traction. But you might say to me, well, they're both pretty, Chris. <laughs> they're bound to get traction. Well, you don't have to be pretty and get that kind of traction. You can also do videos which are 10 minutes long, maximum on LinkedIn, get 10,000 views, and look like this. <laughs> so I actually did a, a, a review, for example, of this great book called The Reputation Game, which is fantastic. You should read it. It's really, 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 really good. And I tagged the two authors, David Waller and Rupert Young, on a Sunday, again, on a Sunday. And on a Sunday, both of them replied. So they got my notification saying I'd mentioned them in a post. And the author basically said, phenomenal, the best speed date summary of the book I've ever seen. So that's someone I don't know, who I tagged, got on LinkedIn. He appreciated the fact I'd shared a review about his book. And he tagged and commented back. That works. That's the beauty of doing this on LinkedIn. Find people that you appreciate your, the, their work and then tag them and let them know. 
And even an hour long, <coughs> Mark Ritson does these lectures. This one's been shared from YouTube, it's an hour and a half long. But it got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views. Because actually it's a fantastic review of what not to do in marketing. And it's brilliant, you can learn so much through it. So I would recommend you look at it. But he actually shared it several times, because so much demand, people saying, can you share it please Mark, can you share it? And he normally gets paid tens of thousands of um, dollars to actually go around the world and actually sharing content. So to get it free on LinkedIn is fantastic, but that's what you get on LinkedIn. Right, we're going to look at some of your profiles now. It's my favorite bit of the presentation. <laughs> Anna, Maria, yeah, there you are. Um, so I have to ask, what's the background picture? It's the Brilliant Mind Symposium in Stockholm, Sweden every year. Fantastic, okay. <laughs> See, I like that because that's your passion. So you're sharing something personal, but it's also a business, and you're making people actually wonder what the hell it is, and take that through. I like your pitch. I like your uh, your picture there, and obviously you got your your marketing communications, and you have a summary section, which is fantastic, and you're sharing every now and again, which is also fantastic, and you have in here about what you do at Zurich. The only thing I would say though is you haven't got any links to the video sites, for example, the website, and also you haven't said what Zurich do. So a lot of people do this. They basically say what they do at the company. We don't say what the company actually does. Ideally, you should do both. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. yes, hey. So again, nice picture. I like the top of the, I like this. This is cool. This is from, where's it from? I don't know. Okay, you just picked it and you thought you like it. <laughs> you gotta tell a story. You can't say, I don't know. <laughs> you gotta tell me a story. Make up a story. Yeah. See, I like that, it's cool. There, yeah, and, uh, I love it. But which is basically what Zurich's all about, the customer series. I've seen from the outside, there's branding and uh, slogans about that as well. So it's very cool. The only thing you do is basically talk about yourself in the third person. Yeah. So basically change that to uh, talk about yourself in the first person, I would say. Um, you do share every now and again, obviously sharing your, your good books, you're sharing Monica, of course. Yes, <laughs> yes, ticks, that's, yes. pay rise coming, yes, that's right, thank you. Um, and again, you basically, you do the same thing. So you have got a case study, which I like, and I like the workshops, I think that's absolutely fantastic. But you say what you do at Zurich, and you don't say what Zurich does for other people. So you've got, that's what I'm saying, just, you've got to imagine this is external, it's not internal. You've got to look outwardly. Uh, Cornelia, oh, it's Cornelia. Hi, so I love the picture. What's the background picture? That's the, in Norway, the hotel thief. The hotel thief? The oh, okay. Okay. Brilliant. No, I love it. I love the fact that you're doing that. Because again, it's personal and it makes you think and it makes you go, wow, what's that? Um, so I like, uh, you've got a summary section and then you share every now and again as well. OMG. <laughs> um, so you shared that. And then again, you're basically, your, uh, you've got one line about Zurich. So basically, you're a global insurance. But then you talk about more about what you do. So try and combine the two. And also, you have no links to the website or YouTube channel. Bits some color in, need some videos. Uh, Frederic. Hi. Um, so, background is Hong Kong, isn't it? Yeah, it's Hong Kong. Uh, oh, so you're based in Hong Kong, so say so that. So really, really cool that you're doing that. Um, and I like the way you use the first person as well, which is fantastic, because it resonates. Um, and then you're sharing as well, uh, talking about different things, not just about insurance, which again is fantastic, although you probably tied this to insurance, did you? Polar Vortex. Did you tie it together? Did you tie the fact that it was people were freezing and therefore they needed insurance or something? <laughs> but it's really cool. Um, and then here, for example, um, you basically brand sponsorship data digital. It's like it's, it's, it's very specific, but it's not really talking very much about what Zurich does or about what you do. So you need to be expand and tell a bit more. And also have some links to the websites, have some links to else places. Because you have more about AXA, where you used to work, than Zurich, where you currently work. So you might want to kind of just rechange it around. Uh, Prince, hey, how you doing? Uh, so I like this. Um, obviously, are they all, these are all the places you visit on a daily basis or something, or weekly basis, or monthly basis, or. <laughs> Oh, the places you lived in, okay. So, um, so these, you've lived in all seven, seven of these places, fantastic. Uh, so what's the one on the left-hand side? Uh, okay, um, so I, I love that story, I love the fact you've got that up there, so and also the fact you've got a, um, you actually talked about your, your experience here, which you're telling a story about it, which is fantastic, uh, and you're sharing on a regular basis as well, which is really, really cool. And then here, for example, you basically tell a lot about what you do at Zurich, but not about Zurich does. So you can combine the two. And also you're in sponsorship, you're in branding, so you've got lots of case studies, some branding you can actually put in there, some videos about sponsorships, and so forth too. <coughs> Evangelia, where is she? Hello. Hello. So, obviously, what you have not done. <laughs> Where's your background picture? 
because you are you know, a group marketing trainee, so you have no excuse, you know, you, and you have no summary section either. You seem to be telling about your story, about why, how you became a group marketing trainee. <laughs> so even here, for example, even here, you've committed the cardinal sin of not being connected to the company page. So you made up a new company. You basically create a new company called Zurich Global Corporate Switzerland, which doesn't exist. Innovation. Yeah, innovation, totally, yes. Uh, but you need to connect with a company page that has a logo. And also talk about what you're actually doing here, for example, with some links. And you have no content marketing. Uh, sure, I can't see you, so I don't know what you look like. So you have no profile picture. So obviously you need to have a profile picture, you need to have a background picture, because currently you're kind of like completely anonymous. So you need to be doing that. You also have no summary section. Um, and ironically, you're, in, you're a manager of corporate identity. <laughs> so it's not even updated. Not even updated. So you don't even do this anymore either. So basically you need, you need lots of content. You need lots of work on your profile, shall we say. Uh, no content marketing either. So Fernando. Fernando, right? Hi. Keep it very quiet over here. You were sat in the wrong place, really, didn't you, at the front? <laughs> so obviously, same thing. You haven't got a picture. You haven't got a background picture. You haven't got a summary section. Um, and you don't say what you basically do at Zurich. You don't say what Zurich does. No content. And you have no content marketing going on here either. <laughs> Frank, where's Frank? Where's Frank? Frank in the room? Frank in the back, yes. Is that you? So I don't know what you look like because you haven't got a picture on your profile. That, you're phoning. That means you've ticked a box that says only your first connections can see your photograph. So basically, and you're, you're oblivious to it because obviously only your first connections come to your profile currently because you have no second connections coming to your profile. So I couldn't see it because I'm only a second connection. So you basically need to change that so you basically can see that everybody can actually see you. <coughs> um, and I like the way you, I might use this in my next slide actually. Former head of strategy at BBH. So that was, that was better than being at Zurich? <laughs> All you need at the end is ex Google and it'll be fine. <laughs> and then you shared uh, this. And we don't really talk about what you do here, apart from the fact you've got details to follow. It's like, <laughs> how long does it take you to write in what Zurich do and what you do at Zurich? Are you still working? It's like a book. Is it you're you working? It's in progress, okay. <laughs> uh, is she here? Uh, yes, so obviously you commit the even bigger cardinal sin of, this is you. <laughs> what on earth is that? <laughs> Again, this is going in my next presentation, you realize that, don't you? <laughs> you're now going to be famous, you're going to be next, okay, what on earth is she thinking? It's like, a dot, oh, whatever that is. Like, I'm not, a diamond or something else, like, I'm not sure what that is. At least you have a photograph, but you have nothing else. Literally, you're just basically, I'm surprised anybody ever finds you, actually. No background picture, you've got Zurich over there, no summary section. Um, you really say what you do at Zurich, but not what Zurich does, <coughs> and there's no links. And you also do no content marketing. And remind me again what you do at Zurich? Um, content marketing, isn't it? So you need to be doing more content marketing. You need to change the title so people know exactly what you do, at least. Jan? No. Nope. That's not here, okay. Mark? Hi, Mark. So, again, so background picture, photograph, summary section. Say again? <laughs> you against. <laughs> Fine, okay. Mark. So, you actually do have a picture. There is a picture there. Okay, well, you've got to make sure your second connection, your third connection, can also see you. Uh, and then you have a bit of content, but here, again, you don't really say what you do or links or anything. <laughs> uh, Matteo. Matteo here. Hi, Matteo. Uh, so, again, good photograph, but nothing in the background. And then no summary section uh, and no content. So, you do, according to your uh, title, digital marketing. So if you do digital marketing, you really have to have some kind of marketing strategy going on, you know. <laughs> you have to set the standard of everybody else, you know, there's no excuse. Uh, Rahel, there's Rahel, is he here? Or is he anonymous? He's disappeared, he's gone to the toilet, okay. Sebastian, 
See here? Yes. Uh, so you have picture, but you have nothing up here, nothing, no summary section, no content. And even here, for example, you don't say what you do or have a content, and you also have no content marketing going on. Uh, Tanya. Tanya here. <laughs> Getting in there straight away, aren't you? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Monica's just there. She'll monitor it tomorrow. Saying, "How's Tanya?" <laughs> so yeah. So you're doing the same thing. You've created a new company called Zurich Insurance Company L Limited, and it has no company page. So you need to put content in there, and you have no content marketing going on either. So the rest of you got away with it. So <laughs> we only picked out 20 profiles. <laughs> but if you want some individual feedback, I can give you some individual feedback. You all go. Thank God, Chris didn't pick on me. So you do want to look at things like employer branding. When it comes to employee engagement, it's very key. So you can go what Paul does here and has his mission statement on his LinkedIn profile. And I love the fact that Green Man Gaming do like, get shit done, spread the word of our belief. But I like the fact they basically drink beer and hug dogs. That's a brilliant personal like, branding and employer branding there. Or you get something like this, like James has gone big on the reds, making sure that his red background picture, red picture here. <coughs> so it's all consistent branding. So every single one of his employees, this is very hard to do, because obviously people basically just don't do things as we've just seen, uh, basically have got red on their background. Uh, Alison here went the red and white route, which I think is really, really cool. All her team have red and white, which is very cool. Uh, Matthew's team have basically an orange circle. <coughs> so all the employees have an orange circle, apart from Nicole, who doesn't want to work there anymore. <laughs> Letting the team down. But ultimately, LinkedIn's a personal branding platform. It's about you. So you need to market your company through your profiles. And ultimately, it's about the leader. <coughs> so it's about the CEO or the chairperson in the particular country you represent and get them to actually promote Zurich through their profiles. So the why this is is because LinkedIn have 610 million members. Only 4 million of them are bothering to follow LinkedIn on LinkedIn. So even if LinkedIn can't get people to follow people on LinkedIn, what hope have Zurich got? None. So don't try and force milk, like water uphill. Use your leader. So you look at something like Jeff Wiener, for example, has 9 million followers. People are more likely to follow Jeff Wiener, the CEO of LinkedIn, than LinkedIn themselves. And same thing with Microsoft, who own LinkedIn, only 6 million followers. Whereas Bill Gates has 18 million followers. So three times as many people follow Bill Gates as follows Microsoft. So people follow people on LinkedIn. People empathize with people. People resonate with people, not with companies. Good example is Rico de Blanc, who I mentioned before. <coughs> He's got 40,000 employees. He sees LinkedIn as a great way of actually doing things like employer branding through content. So he's always talking about things like happy employees and happy guests, for example, or what Apple learned from the Ritz-Carlton and getting hundreds of thousands of views as a result of it. He's not promoting the Ritz-Carlton per se, but of course he is. But he's also getting great traction as a result of it. You look at Arnie Sorison, who's one of the best people at doing this. He's the CEO of Marriott Starwood. And he's brilliant at talking about blogs, about you know, the passion, the purpose that he has, and that his staff have. He's not trying to sell you a Marriott hotel room rate, or why you should have an event at the Marriott. He's talking about the bigger picture here, the bigger vision of what Marriott Starwood are all about. Because you think about his stakeholders, they're all on LinkedIn. Employees, guests, clients, mice, shareholders. You got a question? Yeah, just a question. Do they have a team to do it for them? Yes. He has a team in New York and a team in Hong Kong who does it for him, yes. <laughs> you don't think Arnie's going, no, nope, wait a second, just need to do my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <coughs> totally. I mean, you know, the reason I employ 35 people in Singapore is because we do this for other people, because it takes a lot of work. I mean, Arnie basically is a slightly different thing. He has a team of people doing social selling. So actually, this is about room sales originally, but actually on LinkedIn, it's not. But he has the same people doing social selling across Facebook, across Weibo, across WeChat, across Instagram, across every platform to sell. But it's a social selling team using content. But on LinkedIn, the context is stakeholder engagement, employee engagement, client engagement. And there's a different strategy. So things like this, I'm sure he had some kind of input, but of course it's not written. This one's very interesting. Because basically he took a story about his matter, who's an immigrant, 
in America to exemplify the fact that the best customer service person that he could find was not American. And he basically was doing an anti-Trump thing, because he hates Trump. You can just see all his basic blogs of anti-Trump in one way or the other. And this was a, like, he's very good at doing this. It was quite a brave thing to do, but he knows what he's doing. 90% of his employees don't like Trump. So he knows his employee engagements. He knows his employees are young. And basically, a lot of them are immigrants. So he basically decided to highlight this in his blog. And he's brilliant at doing this. So he's quite out there when it comes to that, which I think is very great. But you look at Mario's <coughs> company page, has actually got twice as many followers as him. Twice as many followers. But the engagement levels are 10 times less. So even though Arnie has half the followers of the company page, he has 10 times the engagement because no one resonates with Marriott's international company page. But they think Arnie's fantastic. And they can be close to Arnie. They think Arnie's fantastic. The best example is Richard Branson. Richard Branson has 19 million followers on LinkedIn. <coughs> and he's very, very clever at using it about the culture, about the no tie, about everything about the, the vision of Virgin. But the top Virgin company... 120,000. Literally less than 0.5% of people follow Virgin Atlantic that follow Richard Branson. People want to find out about him. People like his stuff, share his stuff. It's all about Branson. It's all about how he, Branson, actually markets the entire Virgin Empire through his LinkedIn profile, not through the company pages. And the company engagement is pathetic, 100 likes, comparative to Branson's 13,000, for example. So he gets the engagement and he uses it very well to push his agenda, climate change, corporate responsibility, and so forth. Very, very clever about using it. And of course, it's all free. Because ultimately, it's not what you know on LinkedIn. It's very much about who you know. And I like this picture of the Godfather because basically LinkedIn's like the Godfather. It's about doing favors for people, and someday they, you may ask them for a favor in return, but you may not. So you do a favor for them. It doesn't have to be their wedding day. So what happens if you don't do the favor? <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying Monica's the godfather? <laughs> well, currently you're at the top table, so you better watch out. <laughs> but <laughs> it used to be, never had a client described as the godfather before. So <laughs> it used to be Kevin Bacon had six degrees of separation. It used to be that he knew everyone in Hollywood. Well, now LinkedIn's about three degrees of separation. And the way I demonstrate that is by using the data on LinkedIn. So, for example, I have 10,000 followers, sorry, 10,000 connections on LinkedIn in Singapore alone. So, 10,000. That's only important because it leads me to having 285,000 second, 1.4 million third, and 1.7 million in total in Singapore. So, basically, I can reach anybody who's anybody in Singapore by having 10,000 of the right people in Singapore. But I also have the right people in Hong Kong, where I can reach 1.4 million people. <coughs> Sydney, I can reach 1.9 million people. Shanghai, 1.7 million people. Across the whole of Asia Pacific, I, with my first connections, can reach 149 million people by having the right final first connections. Even in Zurich, I can reach 657,000 people, and I only have 469 connections. That's the power of your first, your second, your third connections. That's how LinkedIn works. So I can reach 8 million people in Germany, for example. They have 12 million people on LinkedIn. I can reach 3.2 million in London, and I can reach 124 million in Europe by having the right kind of first connections. So that's why you need to have a connection strategy and connect with the right kind of people who have the right kind of connections, because that way you can do the same thing. <coughs> None of this is rocket science. It's just connecting with the right kind of people. Because ultimately, people do buy people. Nothing exemplifies that more than Elon Musk. Love him or hate him. Yeah. Uh, do you actually know all of people, or are you just like... Yeah, no, I, love, I know them all. <laughs> <laughs> I know all 125 million people in Asia, yes. No, no, I mean, your first time, you know all the do I know 10,500 people in Singapore? As much as I'd love to say yes to that question, no, obviously I don't. But then what's the benefit of, like, if you don't know them, so you can ask them for... The benefit is social selling. So basically, the reason why... For example, in Zurich, we have so many clients. It's because we started off by having people who knew people in other countries that I dealt with, who recommended us, and then started connecting with people here. I then got access to their first connections. They become my second connections. Their first connections become my third connections. I can then mail them. 
I can only mail people who are my first, my second, and my third connections. And that's the key. If you're doing lead generation, basically you need first connections who have lots of first connections, because they can be your second connections. And that's how sales navigator works. That's how social selling works. It's not about your first, it's about who they know. I mean, you should, never, you should always personalize invitation. I always try and personalize. So hopefully all, all you guys would have got a personalized invitation from me. Um, because basically you were meeting here today. So I always try and personalize the invitation. I think that's very important. Because only about one in 20 invitations I get are personalized. And many, many people won't accept personalized invitations that are not personalized, for example. People get more picky these days. But you don't have to know them. You have to know them in the right context. You have to have lots of share connections, for example, or have a reason or a purpose to actually share with them and to connect with them. If you don't, then basically, you know, if I get an invitation from someone who basically has four connections, I immediately reject them. Because they're basically it's either a fake profile or they're just not real. If they have like hundreds of shared connections, I'll always accept them. Because it basically shows you in the right kind of space. So you do have to have a connection strategy. It's quite important. Because the people do uh, ultimately buy people. People are buying into you. And we believe there's about 12 different ways you can communicate on LinkedIn <coughs> for whatever you want. Whether it's clients, whether it's partners, whether it's PR, whether it's investors. The first one is who viewed your profile. You've done all this work on your profile, you've SEO'd your profile, you use the keywords and the content, it means you get a drive traction for your profile. You can monitor this and measure this. You're driving people to your profile. So then look at them all and then see who they are and then approach them and say, thanks very much for viewing my profile. Start a conversation. Kind of classic social selling. They're starting to research you already. So then start a conversation with them. What, why have they viewed your profile? What made them come there? But start a conversation. Second one is invitations and messages. <clears throat> so you can actually invite people, but use it as a sales message. So because we do so much lead generation, we use my invitations as a message which people can actually reply to. Because people are allowed to reply to that even if they're not a premium subscriber. It's a loophole in LinkedIn. Because normally you have to be premium to connect with somebody or message somebody who's outside of your sphere. So Walter was able to reply, for example, even though I'm not connected to him. Sales Navigator, though, is the key. So basically, if I send an invitation request to Susie, yeah. and I'm not connected to her, okay, she can reply without, without, using, without connecting and without using premium. So it's a loophole, because normally if I want to message Walter, I have to send an in-mail. I don't have any in-mails, but I can't message him. But the invitation gets around that. <coughs> but Sales Navigator is the key to social selling on LinkedIn. Because the way you really use the data is where you create target lists. And within the target list, very much use the data. So use the data to find, for example, you can see here, the target list of 2,000 people, owned as a company 1 to 10, more than 10 years experience, self-employed, or own companies who are my second connections in Singapore. But I can tell of those 1.6 thousand people, the 300 people who have posted on LinkedIn in the last 30 days. Why is that important? Because it means they're active. Because LinkedIn do not give active user status figures. They give total figures. Unlike Facebook, Twitter, and other platforms, you have to give active user figures. LinkedIn don't do that because they're part of Microsoft. And also to, so they can hide the numbers, to be frank. Because the numbers, that basically, as you can see there, only one in five of those people are actually actively promote, actually active on LinkedIn. Correct. Correct. Which perhaps would help her to do a better job. Correct. So there might be reasons that people might put some wrong job descriptions. I think that was more incompetence, actually. I don't think it was. <laughs> I think you're overthinking that. <laughs> but yeah, you can do that. Like the CEO of HSBC, who wasn't the CEO of HSBC, you know, uh, first of all, HSBC, I'm amazed that basically they hadn't come back to me and said, hang on a minute, you're not, the, you're not the CEO of HSBC. But he was obviously using it to get a higher status. So that when someone searched for CEO, he would come up. Because he's got it in his headline. So the key here is that these people are active on LinkedIn. If they're also premium, it means they're actually paying for it. This little orange badge here. You can also see people who change jobs. That's very, very good when it comes to things like you know, starting again or employing a new agency or starting a new insurance policy, for example. They've actually changed jobs. And you also see people mention the news. So basically, you can track people who mention the news, which means they're active. And you can also see, for example, people being posting on LinkedIn. So on Sales Navigator, you can actually filter your feed to make sure you only see content of your leads. 
So I might share, for example, Monica is one of my leads I share and I save on my Sales Navigator so I can always see Monica's posts. Because otherwise, I've got 55,000 followers. I don't see anybody's posts. I have to curate that to make sure on Sales Navigator I actually see Monica's posts, for example. That means that I can actually like and share Monica's post like with Mark, and then Monica will get a notification saying, Chris has liked your post. Chris has commented on your post. So it's a way of actually engaging with our clients, but also lets potential clients, like Mark, for example, at Harley Davidson, know that basically we're looking at the content, sharing things. Next time Mark makes a decision about who to employ for his LinkedIn marketing, he's gonna think about us. Because we're socially selling him without actually selling him at all. <coughs> the fourth way is about open profile. So open profile on LinkedIn is this little button here. Now this enables you to reach out to somebody for free who's a second or third connection. Now you can tell this only on Sales Navigator. So Eduardo Saverin, who you may or may not know, is the second richest guy in Singapore, also the co-founder of Facebook. He lives in Singapore because he escaped paying $21 billion tax to the Americans. Um, so, but part of that is that he has to invest in Singapore's entrepreneurial structure. So therefore, he's made himself an open profile. So when you go to his profile, you can actually message him for free. So don't do it all at once. But you can say, Chris says I can message you about this app I've got. You want to invest, because he's only worth like $11 billion. So, but he has a B Ventures, as he mentions there, which actually invests in startups. And he wants startups to be able to message him for free. Because obviously you don't want to go through a situation where no one can contact him to pitch their ideas. Whereas, <coughs> Darius here, who's a CEO of another company in Singapore, he's hiring he said, drop me a line, but he's not open profile, which means you have to spend an email. If you don't have a premium account, you cannot contact Darius, despite the fact he's hiring and he said, drop me a line. So basically, who are you going to contact? The multi-billion dollar kind of Eduardo Saverin who says, please do so? Or the guy who says, contact me, but doesn't actually enable you to do so? You're going to contact Eduardo. So if you want people to talk to you, become an open profile on LinkedIn. You just go to your settings, change the privacy options, change the communications options, simple as that. Let people contact you. So I'm an open profile, have been for 10 years, because I want contact people to contact me for free. So in summary, like Gladiator, Maximus, he had a reputation which the evil emperor couldn't kill just by killing him. He had to try and besmirch his reputation, because your, your reputation lives on and social media. And I know that because I was on the front page of the newspaper in Singapore for the wrong reasons. I wrote a blog about taxi drivers and I misjudged the mood completely. I got fired for it. So I was on the front page and then ten, five years later, um, after I started rebuilding my reputation and built up a brand, Black Marketing, became an example about what to do in terms of an entrepreneur using LinkedIn. Got on the front page of the Business Times, which is actually a more respectable publication rather than the tabloid. And now how we've got 950 recommendations because we actually do a very good job when it comes to LinkedIn marketing. So what's stopping you is time. Time, time, time. It takes a long time to actually do this. That's why I created Black Marketing. That's why I employ a very culturally diverse team in Singapore. We actually have started employing boys now. <laughs> <laughs> but for many, many years we didn't. Uh, but actually the girls objected to so many uh, girls in the team and they said, no, you need to employ some boys now. So, we actually do have some boys now. Uh, if you did like this, please do recommend my talk. It'd be much appreciated. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Question. Yeah. Of course. Okay. But I've seen you know, there are others that are doing this in politics in a mm. hostile way. So, so we can do that, right? You can and you can't. I mean, I saw someone last week, for example, who had 20,000 followers on LinkedIn, and he, he, he commented he, every single one of his posts was about Brexit. But literally, the engagement levels was no, post, no comments, no likes, no shares, no comments, no likes, no shares. People go, don't care, and it's not personal. And they can get anything about Brexit on just by looking at the news. They're bored of Brexit anyway. So it's like he wasn't making it personalized. And he wasn't making it in a business context. Whereas if he shared something more personal to him, he would have got lots of traction. So you have to be careful with things that are based in the general domain. It's not personal.
unless you happen to meet the Prime Minister of Switzerland or something. Or, you know, you're making it basically personal, or you're having a particular experience which resonates with people. <clears throat> so be careful about sharing generic stuff too much about politics, about religion, about... And you're, in, you're quite a dangerous territory to do religion as well, especially on LinkedIn, unless you happen to be a priest, of course. Or in the business. I mean, what I say is, <clears throat> unless you are basically... Uh, if you have a business basically based on babies or death or illness, you're allowed to share posts about babies, death, or illness. Otherwise, don't do anything about babies, deaths, or illness. Because basically, you have to resonate. You have to make it reasonable to people on LinkedIn. And also, it becomes a very Facebook territory. So, oh, you had a baby. That's fantastic. What's it got to do with business? What's it got to do with LinkedIn? Unless you can basically spin it in some way, um, it doesn't make any sense. So I'd say, think about your content marketing strategy, but make it personal to you. And then the other thing, marketing to your CEO and leader. Yeah. Mm. How many has he got? He doesn't have a profile. Oh. Why not? Do we know why not? Wow. Because <laughs> there are quite a few insurance uh, CEOs who are now on. LinkedIn. Uh, one of the best ones is Manu Life. The Manu Life guy, um, he's uh, Roy, I can't remember his second name, but he actually shares some really, really good stuff and gets hundreds of thousands of views. He talks a lot about employee engagement. Uh, there's quite, I mean, there's, and insurance companies now are really picking up the fact they have to be on, and financial services in general, they have to be on there, if nothing else, than for employee engagement. Next question. I'm stunned into silence. Everyone's going to do their LinkedIn profile. Go on, Monica. <laughs> uh, and, and the second thing is then also always all about you, but not about the company. Mm. I mean, I listen to you carefully about the company, of course, yeah. as well. How do we counterbalance this? Oh, it's, it's not about your personal profile, it's mm. also about promoting the company, which I think is very important. Does it mean I have to put Zurich a hashtag in all my. Well, I think you probably should do, plus insurance and fintech, what are the keywords you have? But the whole point is if you post something about Zurich Insurance, I'm more likely to watch it and read it and engage with it and like it and comment on it than if basically a Zurich Insurance company on the company page, where I'm not. I feel no responsibility to Zurich Insurance or empathy, whereas I feel an empathy with you, for example. So you're most more likely to basically warm to people. That's why Richard Branson works so well, because people like to have basically like and share and comment and have it appear on their feed. So people go, oh, he's commenting on Richard Branson's feed. And if Richard Branson's team of people respond, they can go, oh, Richard Branson responded. Of course, Richard Branson's not doing it. His team are doing it. But basically, it's on your feed. Suddenly, you feel close to Richard Branson. So basically, you have to sell the companies through you. You know, that's the point of trying to make that. And you do have to be a bit of time. Normally, when, I, when people say to me they've got no time, I normally say, how much time do you spend on Facebook a day? And in Singapore, literally, literally they spend about three hours a day on YouTube, about four hours a day on, on Facebook. It's like one of the most connected uh, countries in the whole of the world. And I say, if you just switched over five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night on your LinkedIn, you'd make wonders in terms of your profile and your status and your, your, your sharings. And your search would go up, your views would go up, merely by doing five minutes a day in the morning, five minutes a day at the night. So it doesn't have to be massive. You don't have to spend hours and hours and hours. <clears throat> but it does work if you just pay a bit of attention to it. Sales Navigator does take a long time. It's the biggest drain of our team is Sales Navigator because it takes an enormous amount of time because it's just complicated and LinkedIn don't make it very user friendly. Does anyone actually use Sales Navigator here? You do. Okay. What do you tend to use it for? When I go to the expiry, uh, set up the uh, Yeah. Uh, Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. This was very isolated at LinkedIn, as if there's only a LinkedIn. Yep. How do you embed LinkedIn into a broader social digital strategy? Well, that, I mean, the question there is do you need to? Do you want to? Exactly. Do you need to? Who are you targeting? It's like if you're like me and you're only targeting entrepreneurs and business people, then you don't actually need a Facebook strategy or an Instagram strategy or a YouTube strategy. You basically just want to be on LinkedIn. And I proved it last year with we had the social selling event which we, at Microsoft and we sold 400 tickets. We sold out. And I only use LinkedIn. People are saying to me, oh, you have to do Facebook adverts. You have to do Google search. I go, no, no. I'm going to prove you can basically sell 400 tickets at $200 each by using only LinkedIn. And I did. 
And this year we've gone to a bigger venue, we're gonna do 500 tickets, we'll sell you know, 500 tickets. And we'll only use LinkedIn. Because if you get your target audience right, it's perfect. So for you guys, you might be thinking about obviously your business customers, you only need LinkedIn. However, if your business customers, for example, are in countries like Japan or Korea, who don't use LinkedIn, basically you will have to use other platforms like Twitter or Facebook or other things. So I think it depends on the country and it depends on the product area you're looking at. If you're obviously B2C, obviously don't you bother using LinkedIn at all, apart from if you're targeting high net worth individuals. Yeah. Uh, you know, direct, uh, uh, physical yep. and maybe it's just one part yeah, of, of course. So is that something, is there a specific, you know, integrated marketing communication strategy that includes LinkedIn in the way that we drive our customers? Of course, yeah, yeah. And that is, it's one pillar. It's one pillar you have to basically think about in terms of a content marketing strategy, but it has to be different. You can't just use a Facebook post on LinkedIn. You can't use an Instagram post on LinkedIn has to be specific to the professional audience and also the more sophisticated audience. It's one of the reasons why advertising doesn't work on LinkedIn. You know, and basically, LinkedIn will basically try and get you guys to spend lots of money on advertising on LinkedIn. It does not work. People like to see authentic videos. People like to see authentic content. People like to see authentic photographs. People like to see you sharing things, not just something that says sponsored post or sponsored in-mail or adverts or messy. And the adverts on LinkedIn are also in the wrong area anyway. They're on the right-hand side, not the middle. And people are looking at the feed. People look at the content. And often people can opt out. So I've opted out of sponsored in-mails, for example. I've opted out of seeing lots of sponsored posts. And you can do that on LinkedIn. So you basically keep your feed clean. Or you report advertising you don't like, for example. You have lots more control on LinkedIn than you do something like Facebook. So basically you have to obviously integrate it into a, an overall plan in terms of your content marketing plan, but treat it very differently. Any other questions? <laughs> It's a very good question. Um, I would say it depends on who you're targeting. So we have global clients. We have clients in America, clients in London, clients in Zurich, clients in Shanghai, clients in Australia, clients in New Zealand. Now all of them have different time zones. They're all using LinkedIn in different, different ways. So I have to occasion for the fact that you post in different ways. So I use something called Buffer to actually basically post when I'm asleep or post when I'm at the gym or whatever. You basically post in different areas. But I've toyed around and played around with how much is, is too much. And there is no answer. Because as LinkedIn grows, you know, I came to Asia, LinkedIn had 10 million people, now it's 200 million people. Basically, you have more competition. So you have to get some kind of resonance of the quality of your content, try and get some kind of traction. Now, is that posting more or is that posting better? I would say it's posting better, and then basically just being clever about when you post it, how you use hashtags, how you use videos, and so forth as well. And you have to basically keep on iterating, keep on iterating, test different things. What content works, what content doesn't work. Yeah, I've realized that you know, our curated content, for example, no matter how much I try, basically doesn't have the same traction as I just do a picture of me at, basically at a business function. Or me, for example, in the hospital. You know, something stupid like that. And basically, we'll get, you know, even on different days, we'll get tens of thousands of views. Because it's personal, it's personal branding. So you have to basically just look at the data. LinkedIn gives you all the data, so you really have no excuse. What works, what doesn't work. You look at subject matter as well. You know, this guy last week, basically, who just posted all about Brexit, the, the, the platform was telling him, his followers did not want to know anything more about Brexit, so stop sharing stuff about Brexit. People were sick about it. Plus, he was not giving any particular insight or anything new. So people were going, oh, you know, you're sharing what people don't know, so people don't know, and you're sharing that. You can't do that. Where's your personal insight? Where's your personal recommendation? Where's your video talking about how it, what it means to you? Because actually, this guy was in foreign currency, so he actually had lots of reasons to talk about how it's basically screwing up his business because he couldn't work out his foreign, foreign currency from March or April onwards. But he didn't do that. He just shared something for The Guardian or the BBC, for example. So you have to make it personal. What does it mean to you as a business owner, for example? So there is, there's no, it's all about what you feel. You know, it's three a day, it's four a day, it's one a week. We have clients who want to post 10 times a day. We have clients who want to post once a week. Everyone's personal. Yeah. And what about languages as well? I see a lot of people posting in Turkish, Russian. <laughs> would English be you say Russian? <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, it's, it's two great, great questions there. So, the timing, I've hoped I've addressed with the fact that I've highlighted the fact you can post on a Sunday and you get more traction because multinationals like you guys are not working on a Sunday. So, but you are still looking at social media apps looking for content. So actually get more resonance. I find, for example, on a Saturday, if I post something or send out messages on a Saturday, 
I will hit entrepreneurs who will respond because they're also working on a Saturday. So you have to think about basically people are using LinkedIn going to work, coming back from work, and then cold countries, basically lunchtime. Not in, not in um, hot countries like Singapore where they go out for lunch. So hitting them at lunchtime is pointless. So you have to think about culturally about the different countries, about you know, when you're going to get to people. And the language question is an interesting one because you can adapt your profile to 64 different languages now. So basically, if you want it to be read by someone who's Japanese, basically they'll, they'll read it and it'll say Japanese version uh, or English version or Mandarin version, whatever it happens to be. The posts, however, are more interesting. We have German clients, for example, they want us to post in German and in English because they realize that just post in German that only basically German speakers can actually read it and they have English clients, they need to basically have uh, it available to people in English as well. But you're right, some people, for example, and I've met lots of people this week, and they're just posting in German which is fine, apart from the fact they then tell me they're a global business. I'm going, well, that's nice and everything, I can't read it. And lots of other people can't read it. You know, people in Japan can't read it, people in China can't read it, people in America certainly can't read it. So you look at basically, you know, where do you want to get traction? You basically have to look at who you're pitching at. So it's not about you, it's about who you want to read it. If you only want Germans to read it, fine. But if you're making a global point and you have a global business, you have to speak English. That's why India's got 55 million followers and 55 million people on LinkedIn, and it will have 100 million in a couple of years' time. It will overtake the states within five years, just sheer by pure numbers. You know, whereas you know, obviously uh, China has 45 million, but they tend to be posting in Mandarin for their Chinese uh, numbers, but also in English to hit the international community. So you have to look at who you're pitching at. So there is no kind of one failed way of doing it apart from to post in English. It's business English is the best one. Next question. Any other questions? You're rapidly doing your homework now. Yes, sorry. You mentioned before about the audience Yes. Ah, but you don't have to. You don't have to have a lot. That's the, the other point I'm trying to make. Is you don't have to have a lot. So the um, the Manulife um, CEO, for example, I think he has like six thousand connections, but he gets hundreds of thousands of views because his content was particularly good, and because he's the CEO of the company. So how much you Well, that's why I get the four. So the four one one. So the one hard sell about Zurich Insurance, one about fintech. What about the insurance industry or financial services? And then four unrelated posts. So I would say you follow that rule, you can't go far wrong. You can't just continue to go, you know, four, 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 but then people might, you know, you're not marketing your company at all. But that's better than actually doing one, one, one hard sell post about Zurich Insurance the whole time, because then people will unfollow you, people will stop hiding your feed. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. As long as it's in a business context, completely. And as long as you make it personal to you, what's it matter to you, what's it mean to you, then that's the key. You know, what's it mean about you? you know, why are you sharing something? You have to say, it has to be some kind of reason about why you're sharing something. Any other questions? If you do have any other questions, obviously you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. If you do have any other questions basically about your profile, you don't want to ask in front of everybody else, you can also reach out on LinkedIn. Uh, if you're basically saying, oh my God, my profile's terrible, we don't want to highlight this to everybody in the room, then please do reach out to uh, me on LinkedIn as well. Monica. Very good. So Chris, thanks a million. Um, very much appreciated. Okay. So I think your presentation <laughs> was great. Uh, big applause for Chris. And a big plea for my side as well. I mean, I, uh, I had discussions about, do you want to force me to do LinkedIn? I'm like, no, I will not force you to do LinkedIn. But my personal belief is, if you're working in marketing, and especially digital marketing, at least you should know the basics and try some things. Do you have to be at the same level as Chris? Maybe not, but at least I think that's good to have a discussion and know what we're talking about. And I mean, just uh, listening to Frederick again and what AXA is doing, I think that we at Zurich can do more as well. Uh, and the question is how to best do it. And for that, now we have a good connection. Yeah? Sure. Uh, what I also believe is there's not only social media um, and digital uh, selling, so to speak. We also have the physical world. Yeah? Right. And I have to hold this hat up because I still love it. And it was the big hit in Davos this year. Yeah? I know that it will destroy your <laughs> personal branding, 
But because it is relatively cold in Zurich, I thought you get a present, uh, which all the big leaders in Davos had as well. So you will get one of those blue hats. Yeah. I have to admit that this one I borrowed from Mark Lou because he's wearing it all the time. But Nadia promised to send you one, and maybe you have one by tomorrow. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> yes, so thanks a lot, Chris. <laughs> and I want to see a, a post on LinkedIn with that hat. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> Take a picture. Take a picture of me and Monica then with the uh, the hat. Yes. <laughs> I, don't know, I can't put it oh, on, but yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs>